What up? It's 92.9 WDUP, New London's home of timeless hip hop and RB. It's your boy Mike Mitch Ill. We got a special guest. We have the lovely Lisa Dawn Miller, daughter of Motown legend Ron Miller. She has a new record, I Need I Need Your Love, and we're going to premiere that at the conclusion of this interview. Lisa, thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm good, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, so, you know, you got the new record. Talk about the new record, I Need Love. I Need Your Love, excuse me. You know, talk about the record a little bit. Well, I'm very excited about it. Um, I worked with an incredible rapper named Marcus H who just brought so much to it. I co-wrote it with uh, DJ Robinson and Oliver Richmond. And, you know, it has like a, a new uh, feel and yet it's got that old school vibe. So, yeah. you know, we put a lot of um, background vocals and we just had a lot of fun with the record. And um, a lot of the radio stations are starting to play it, including you. So thank you. Yep. <laughs> so yo, for those who may not know, um, I think before I get to that question, let's talk about let's go back to the record. Do you have an actual like visual in the making for like you gonna put out a video or anything for the record? I don't have a, a video coming out for this record, but Marcus H and I are doing another song. It's actually a remake of a song that my father wrote. My father's name was Ron Miller. He was a legendary Motown songwriter. And he wrote songs like uh, For Once in My Life, Touch Me in the Morning, Place in the Sun, Heaven Help Us All, Yesterday, 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 Someday Christmas, lots of Stevie stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, anyway, uh, one of the songs he wrote was uh, Diana Ross, is one of her biggest hits called touch me in the morning mm -hmm. and nobody has ever covered that song because how, how do you cover diana ross right? right um so i decided to do it as a duet with this incredible rapper singer uh marcus h and we're coming out with this um in may and yes there will be a video for that one so there'll be more on that at my website yeah. all right so, yo, let's talk about your background, you know, coming up. I mean, I'm sure you got to rub shoulders with all these big names, you know, because of who your father is. You know, kind of talk about your background and introduce yourself to our listeners out here a little bit. Uh, well, um, my background is uh, I grew up in the music industry. Um, I also have a finance background, and I think... Um, one of the things about being in the music industry, and I think it's so tough for so many artists, is understanding the business side of things. And I think because of my business background, it's really helped me now as I'm pursuing this artistry to, to navigate the music industry because it's a tough world. And one of the things that I've been really involved in for the past several years is fighting to get the rights back to my father's song catalog you know, for so long. I mean, he, you know, it's a million dollar song catalog, but my father died with holes in his shoes and barely enough money to buy a cup of coffee while others made a lot of money on his songs. And it took me 16 years to fight for the rights, but I got it back. And right. the reason that I wanted to get it back was not necessarily for the royalties, but really I want to tell my dad's story because I think it's such an incredible, Incredible story. I mean, he goes back to the days. He's one of the original songwriters that Barry Gordy brought on to Motown when they were starting with Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and Smokey Robinson and Mickey Stevenson and Holland Dozier Holland. My dad was one of the original guys. And he has an incredible story that I want to share, but you can't do anything unless you have the rights to the yeah. song. So I guess my message to a lot of like young people coming up is that, you know, make sure you care for your intellectual properties. Mm -hmm. Make sure that when you're writing your songs that you're holding on to your publishing and that you understand the business deals because that's the most important thing. Um, so now that I have my dad's songs, um, I started a new show about him called For Once in My Life, The Songs of Ron Miller. Uh, we just premiered uh, the show in New York City at 54 Below, and I'm going to be at Vibrato in Beverly Hills on March 13th and also um, at Chelsea Table and Stage in New York on the 25th. Um, so I'm really excited about that. We're going to tour it all over the country. Um, in fact, we're probably going to be near you guys. So if you go to my website, you'll be able to lisadawnmiller.com. You'll be able to to get touring information. So I'm I'm really excited about this show and sharing my dad's story. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, talk about your dealings over here. You know, you talk about no wink and you know y'all Connecticut a little bit. Oh, so we got, gotcha. Next time you out here, you gotta actually pull up. This, you know, <laughs> right there. You know, talk about some of your dealings out here. 
Well, I got to tell you, I, okay, I have a show called Sandy Hackett's Rat Pack Show. We tour all over the country. And one of our favorite stops is in Noank, Connecticut, because there's a place there called Abbott's Lobster. And my father, my husband's father was legendary comedian Buddy Hackett. They toured all over the world for decades, and they always stopped at Abbott's Lobster because it is the best in the whole world. And every time we're in that part of the country, we've got to stop there. So that's why I was asking you earlier, like how close is New London to Noank? Yeah, Abbott's, man, if you can hear, you're in earshot, man. Yo, we need to <laughs> cut the check. We need to put it on like... <laughs> We're also going to be uh, with the Rat Pack show. We're going to be at Bill Haney's um, North Shore Music Theater. I have a show that recreates what it would have been like to spend an evening with the Rat Pack. And I don't know if your listeners know who that is, but, you know, long before all the legends, even, you know, my favorite Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and all those guys, there was Sammy Davis Jr. And Sammy was part of the Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. And we have a theatrical production that we tour all over the country. It will be at the North Shore Music Theater on uh, March 16th mm -hmm. in Beverly, Massachusetts. That's dope. Yeah, so make sure you stay in tune with that. Visit our website, you know, keep up with what she got going on. Um, so let's get back to your music. You know, um, when did you start actually doing music yourself? Because you started off and you kind of mentioned it, you know, but it's a big deal. VP at Morgan Stanley, you know what I'm saying? That's, that ain't nothing to sneeze at, you know what I mean? Can I talk about? Well, okay, yes. Yeah, so um, so my, I grew up um, with uh, hanging out with Motown, friends and family and everything. And But I really wanted to have this background in business because I thought, I, you know, someday that's going to serve me well. So I started out as a young stockbroker uh, with Morgan Stanley, and I worked my way up to first vice president of investments. And um, I, when things got tough uh, in the entertainment industry, as I, you know, began to pursue that, I just would buy call options on Apple, <laughs> Apple stock and do well. So, um, but yeah, that, that was a really um, important part of my life because it really taught me how to navigate the business world, which I think is so important important. And um, then from there, I met my husband in Vegas and um, he has an entertainment background in comedy. Um, so we decided to put this Rat Pack show together and we've been touring all over the country for the last several years. And now we have all these new shows. Um, but, you know, in the middle of that, I thought, you know what, I, I have to pursue my own music career. In addition to, you know, the theatrical and performing with the other shows I produce, I'm part of, I really love recording. I love being in the studio. I'm in my studio right now. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> uh, I love writing. I've got a ton of music coming out mm -hmm. this year. Um, I have a big ballad coming out next month called There You Are. It's a song that I wrote for someone who was very important to me. His name was James Wallace. Um, and he passed away. He was a mentor and a friend and someone I love so much. And it's a long time coming. Um, I uh, worked with Eric Nickerson on the strings and I'm very excited. If you go to my Spotify at Lisa Dawn Miller or my website, you'll be able to get information about that. So that's my next record coming out. Okay. Yeah. Please send that when when it's ready. You know what I'm saying. So um, I mean, what do you like more? Like, you know, what is you know, all right, you know, we got into the business field. Uh, you're doing theater. You know, you you songwriting. You're making music for yourself. Like, which one kind of like you know what I mean? It's top notch. I yeah, I mean, I have to say I love the creative process mm -hmm. and I love performing live. So when I can take those things, be creative, um, go into the studio. As I said, I love being here, but then taking this and putting it on stage and performing for a live audience. Um, there is one other project that I'm working on. Um, I'm developing a show for Broadway um, called A Place in the Sun. It's a, a story about my father's life using his songs to tell the story of his life. And I'm really excited. We're having our first table read here in Los Angeles on February 7th. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, anything where I can combine being creative and being on stage and I love working with talented people, just talented writers and producers. There's so many great, wonderful artists out there. So like to be able to work with Marcus H and then also Oliver Richman, who's my son. Um, if you guys want to see a huge talent and I'm predicting this, this kid, yeah, I'm not just saying this is his mom, but if you go to Oliver Richman, R-I-C-H-M-A-N, and you check him out on TikTok. This kid is writing a song a day every day this year. 
and they're going viral. And, um, you know, so it's like a generational, you know, I like being able to, um, I'm proud of my father, that generation. And then our generation is, you know, getting the rights back and telling the story. And then we pass it on to the next generation. And, and um, you know, doing my prep for this interview, I, I seen you perform at the Stevie Wonder concert at the Microsoft Theater. Amazing job, by the way, you know what I'm saying? I got the sound effects, you know what I mean? Throw the clap on there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you did a great job there. You know, like, what was that? Was that, like, one of your biggest actual, like, live performances you ever had? Thank you. Um, well, I've toured all over the country, so I've been at some really cool places. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I have to say, Stevie Wonder, there is no other artist in the world like Stevie Wonder period. You know, I went to the Grammys last year and I had all these pictures and I hanging out with all these people. And I just wrote, you know what? There was Stevie Wonder and then everyone else, Stevie, yeah. Stevie. I mean, my dad had an incredible relationship with him because he was just a young artist um, coming up at the time mm -hmm. when he came to Motown. And the way that that came about that performance is that Justin Bieber, had just come out as a young kid on this new thing called YouTube. And he put a record out. I mean, he put a, a video out of him live doing the song Someday at Christmas. Well, Stevie only did one Christmas album in all of his career. He's only done one Christmas album. And my dad wrote almost every song on that album, including Someday at Christmas. Wow. And I thought, you know what, if Stevie, um, you know, I mean, if Justin Bieber could come out with that, and at the time, President Obama invited Justin Bieber, who was pretty unknown at the time, to come and sing Someday Christmas. I'm like, I told my son, who at that point was about 10 years old, I said, look, if we put out another song from that album, maybe President Obama will invite you. So we did a video. We put it out on this thing called YouTube mm -hmm. of another song from that album called One Little Christmas Tree. And about two weeks later, President Obama did not call, but Stevie Wonder called and said, hey, I heard Oliver sing that song, and I, I wanted to know if there's any way he could come and perform that at the Nokia, which was the Nokia Theater at the time. Uh, there's about 7,500 people live at my concert at the House Full of Toys. And I'm like, well, I don't know, Stevie, I'm going to have to think about that. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and then I wound up getting invited on the show. And Stevie went on there and he talked about my dad and he was so moved. He didn't introduce anybody else that night. I think Babyface was there. Janelle Monet was there. I was there. I was invited to sing. He only in introduced Oliver. And when he was telling the story about For Once in My Life, he said, you know, I had just heard Tony Bennett's version and I'm this young kid. And Ron Miller walks into my office with me and my, 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 my studio with me and Hank Cosby. And I'm listening to his song and I'm putting this uh, 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 beat to it. And mm -hmm. Ron's like, You're ruining my song, Stevie. It's supposed to be a ballad. He goes, no, Ron, it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot. And he and he says, no, no, no. He goes, look, if it's not a hit, I'll buy you dinner. And my dad said, no, if it is a hit, I'll let you drive my car. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it went on to become the biggest version of it. And Tony Bennett was very upset that Steve, oh, he was happy, but I mean, he didn't have the big hit with it that Stevie did. But then years later in 2006, Stevie Wonder and Tony Bennett did a duet of that song and won like four Grammys for that recording of that song. So mm -hmm. it was pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, I was at the Grammys last year too. You know what I mean? You probably crossed cross paths and even know it. You know, <laughs> about the Are you going weekend. this year? I'm going this going? weekend. I'm out there next oh, weekend. Yeah, yeah, I'm out there. yeah you see in the background. You. you know what I mean? It's like my, my first time going to the Grammys. I was in Vegas. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you maybe I'll see you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But like, what was it like growing up? You know, what I mean, your father being who he is. So you got to you know be around these people, like being young and seeing all these legends. You know, what was that like for you? Well, what's interesting is that they weren't legends when I knew them. They all, mm. my mom used to talk about how everybody used to come over. She made her Filipino chicken and everybody loved it. No one had any money. All they did was smoke cigarettes and write songs. They mm. wrote about what was going on at the time and civil rights and equality. And some of those songs are even more profound today than they were back then. Mm. I mean, this is during the Detroit riots and I was just a baby at the time. I don't even remember that. But then when Motown came out, to Los Angeles, you know, obviously people were becoming famous and, and, but they still weren't the legends that they are today. And I look back at that time and I think, wow, I'm so proud to have come from that, that dynasty of Motown. And, and I'm, you know, close with a lot of the Motown alumni and, mm -hmm. 
you know, when you're in that kind of greatness, you, you know, people often ask me when they hear me say, well, where did you go to school? Where did you train? And I'm like, well, I, I grew up watching my dad produce people like Stevie Wonder and, you know, Celine Dion and Diana Ross and people. That's better like than that. any school. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I remember being in the studio with my dad where they would take a song and they would produce it and go through it line by line by line by line. And, you know, when you're conditioned to 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 you're exposed to that, that's all, you know. Mm -hmm. So I feel very grateful and very, very fortunate. And I've got to tell you about Stevie Wonder. I mean, this is a man who is, you know, the biggest legend in the world. And yet he's just the same Stevie that he was all those years ago. I mean, he was so sweet to Oliver, you know, just treated him with such gentle care, you know, and I just thought, wow, he he has every reason to, you know, put his nose up in the air and he he's just so connected to such a higher place than this. So jamming on the one, jamming on the oh, Cosby, I don't know if y'all remember that, but not. like if Stevie wanted to kind of like, all right, everybody has the public perception of Stevie, but like what, what is he like, what you're willing to share, like, you know what I mean, he, off camera? He, he is the nicest person. I mean, you would think that he's just like any other guy, but he reminds me a lot of my dad because when we were backstage at that house full of toys, he had a keyboard that was that he was had around his neck and he was playing it. He's always writing. My dad was always writing too. So all of those guys from the time were such geniuses. It's always flowing through them. And I remember my mom who had written some songs also, she wrote um, Everyone's a Kid at Christmas Time with my dad. And Stevie Wonder um, recorded that. And um, she he asked for my mom to come to his dressing room. And when she came in, he just started singing another song that they had written and that he had recorded as if no time had passed, even though years had passed. You know, he's talking about his mom and dreams he was having about his mom. And he just like, you know, you could tell that they went way back. And and um, my mom has since passed. And um, but that, you know, he they're just... He, he's the nicest person in the world. Yeah. So let's talk about your music again. You know, kind of describe your sound. You know, we got the record. I need your love, which we premiering right after this interview. But like, you're sounding general. And like, how can people go back and check some of your past work you've been putting out through the years? Well, I have to say, I have such uh, my favorite music to listen to is R and B. I will always love R and B, especially old school R and B. I love Janet. I mean, I just that's like my, you know, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder. I mean, Babyface. I mean, those are all the people that I love. And um, so I think with this record, I wanted to infuse something that felt new and that maybe um, you know a, a, a new, younger audience could connect to. And I met Mark. Marcus H, who's a young guy, probably 21 or something. And I said, just, just give it like your feel. I, I want mm -hmm. you to, to, to put your rap in there, like how you felt. And he wrote that whole part of it and performed it. And it was great. So I think my style is, you know, R and B slash soul mm -hmm. um, slash pop, but I'm also known in theatrical in the theatrical world as a ballad singer. My dad was a ballad writer. So every song even though for once in my life was up tempo by Stevie and all these songs that he did, he always wrote everything as a ballad because he had more of a musical theater background. So I love a, a good ballad, but when I'm in the studio, I love playing with all of the, the, you know, the, the tools that we have available to us to create beats and put layers of voices and, and things like that. So I would say that I'm between like R and B and pop. That's, okay. that's what I think of myself. So. Yeah. I always ask everybody, everybody who's a singer that comes on here, like the state of R and B, I feel like it's in an awful place. I mean, there's still people that put out good records. Maybe I'm spoiled because like I love 90s R&B, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, in the 80s, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's different now. Like, I even ask, like, why aren't there any more, like, R&B groups, you know what I mean? In Vogue, speaking of Connecticut, big up Dawn Robinson, she from New London, you know, we had Destiny Childs, Totals, 112. I mean, like, just the state of R&B today, well, what you think about I it? Well, I think, I mean, a lot of people are saying it's dead, it's not there, but I mean, mm -hmm. you listen to her and yeah, her, her, yeah. her is like amazing. And I, and I think to myself, you know what, a great song is a great song. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it was 50 years ago or 50 years from now. I mean, my dad's song, Someday at Christmas is bigger now than it was when he wrote it 60 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's recording it. Samara Joy just recorded Someday at Christmas mm -hmm. and Brandy just recorded Someday at Christmas, you know? Um, so I think that it a great song is 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 good in any 
um, in any generation. And, and if it may not be number one on the charts today, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen tomorrow. I think yeah. that, that, that everything is cyclical. So, you know, I, I, I would love to see more R and B records, number one on the pop charts, just mm -hmm. because they're, you know, that's, they're great songs. So many of the stuff that I grew up on and great artists. So I, I hope to see it, um, you know, make a comeback. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. Um, speaking of your father, uh, you know, he's a historic songwriter, but do you have any songs from himself? Or he's just like strictly, I'm just going, you know, be the ghostwriter for everybody and, you know, things like that. Do you have oh, any of his own records? It's interesting that you should say that because you know who the best singer of my dad's songs were? Him. <laughs> He had the most gorgeous, like he sounded like Barry White. I mean, he had the oh, most the deep baritone voice, were uh, really deep, and you know, and all the girls loved him because he had that deep voice and he was a yeah. songwriter. Um, but he was never really interested in pursuing a career for himself. He just liked producing records and writing, but he would always do all of his demos. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is that now that I'm doing this show about my dad, um, I have all of those recordings and I have his original writings when he wrote like on paper, the songs, the lyrics. So I'm incorporating that into the show, into the multimedia presentation of the show so that people can hear my dad's voice. They can hear his original demos. They can see the things that he's written. Um, and also, so um, I'm coming out with a new songbook that is going to be incredible. I picked 20 of my favorite songs of my dad's. And it's not just a songbook where you play the music. I have just incredible stories and pictures and, you know, letters to my dad and from my dad to all these incredible artists. And it's going to be amazing. And I'm, I'm hoping to get that out in the fall of this year. So look for that on my website, too. Okay. Are there any like challenges, you know, coming up underneath your dad's shadow? You know, your dad's a big deal and you trying to make your own name. You know, talk about some of the challenges you may face. When you, you come I, up. I, I'm so glad that you asked me that question because so many people think, oh, yeah, your dad was Ron Miller. So it's easy for you, Mike. I can tell you it's twice as hard having my dad be Ron Miller, because if I was just out here doing my own thing, I'd be writing my own songs and putting all of my effort into building my own brand. But mm -hmm to take a legacy songwriter and turn it into a brand where people actually know the story and know who that person is, it is not an easy thing. People usually don't care about the songwriter. They don't care about the background. They don't care about what went into making the song. So for me, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of Motown artists as well, where you have, you know, the heirs of the, uh, of the composers who have died or the writers who have died, and they're trying to, you know, get their dad's name or their mom's name on the map and people just don't get it. And you don't have a, you know, even though I'm with Sony music publishing, because they've been handling the publishing on the catalog for so long, it's not like they're standing in line saying, here's a bunch of money to invest and in. you go out and you do something with it. I have to take my own money, my own resources and my own time, number one, for the past 16 years to fight to get the rights back from them, from the industry. Now that I have them, I have to find creative projects and I have to invest and put my time and energy into putting the story out there because without telling the story of Ron Miller, you just have 500 songs. Nobody connects them as, you know, when, when you think of Babyface, you know, his catalog, when you think of, you know, Oscar Hammerstein in musical theater, you know, his catalog. But when you think of Ron Miller, you're like, Oh yeah. What, I, what, you, you know, the song, but you don't connect the song with his name. So mm -hmm. in my lifetime, what I want to do is make sure that people know the name Ron Miller, that this was a guy who wrote about, love and hope and equality at a time when, you know, it, it, we, the world needed to hear this. And now yeah. we're at the same place, probably even more so than back then. And the work is timeless. It's going to be around 50 years from now, a hundred mm -hmm. years from now. And, and it's, you know, when you say some of the challenges, it's just hard. I mean, believe it or not, my dad is not in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, should be. There are people in the Songwriters Hall of Fame who don't even have a tenth of the hits of my father. Um, you know, it, it it's just everything's very political. And I yeah. think that, you know, it's just a lot of work and I'm happy to do it. I'm honored to do it. But but it's not an easy task. Yeah. Now, nah, respect for everything you're doing for your father. But um, while he was here, like what was like some of his biggest gripes that he expressed to you? You know, what I mean, coming up, I mean. I feel like songwriters don't get the love they want because uh, you're not front and center, but like you are the 
you know what I mean, the brainchild of this particular record that might be huge and be timeless and last forever. You know, like talk about some of um, the gripes your pops might have had, you might express to you that you're willing to share. Well, I think that people, God, you asked such great questions, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, I think that people automatically think, oh, it's a great song and everyone's going to just love it and you're going to get it recorded by Beyonce and you're done. It doesn't yeah. work that way. You know, you write a song and you've got to go to the business people who, you know, God bless them. They're great because without a business, as I said, you need to learn that part of it, but they're not necessarily the creative sometimes they are sometimes they're not but if you're going to someone who doesn't see your creative vision and yet they're the ones who are going to go out and sell it it's almost mm -hmm. like they have to say so in it that's never going to be a hit and and I think it was hard because my dad Barry Gordy told me Barry Gordy the founder of Motown Records said for once in my life the reason it was a hit is because your father carried it from singer to singer to singer to singer in Detroit back in the day. And if he hadn't done that, it would have never become the record that it did. He got it to Tony Bennett and then Stevie heard it from there and then the rest is history. But um, I think for him, it's just getting people to listen, getting people to understand. My dad was a ballad writer. And when disco happened and up tempo happened and our, you know, everything changed, um, you know, people wanted to say, oh, you, you know, you're a dinosaur. You need to write something a little bit more up-tempo. And my dad just never wanted to sell out. But now here we are 60 years later and those disco songs and those up-tempo songs, nobody ever heard of them, but they're still singing for once in my life, you know? So yeah. he always used to say that when he was writing, he never, you know, people used to ask him, how do you tune into today's themes? He goes, I don't. He said, I write timeless emotion. You know, for once in my life, I have someone who needs me someone I've needed so long is something someone could have felt a hundred years from now. And it's something they could have felt a hundred years that they could feel a hundred years, years from now or back then. So it's not specific to where we are in time right now. And I think that's why his songs have lasted, but, and transcended time. But I think during the time that he was pitching his songs, no one wanted to listen. Mm -hmm. Now everybody says, oh yeah, your dad was such a genius. Great, great, great. But at the time he was, you know, he used to say, um, what did he say? He used to say, I'm singing to deaf ears and blind eyes. And, you know, it's like, don't let the door kick you in the butt on the way out. Nobody mm -hmm. wanted to listen. And now they hear now that he's gone. And my mom always said, someday the world will discover Ron Miller. And it's so sad because his songs are so big and everybody knows his songs. And it's only now in his death that I'm telling a story that people will say, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there was a guy who really contributed a lot to the, to the music industry and his name was Ron Miller. So, yeah. I mean, for once in my lifetime, uh, well, well, excuse me, for once in my life, I mean, I'm trying to think what comedy show ended with that. Was it Kevin Hart or Dave Chappelle? Just like recently. I forget, oh, like, wow. you know, yeah, there's so, so many. I know, it's just like, you know, if I hear that record, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's timeless, you know, and if I made timeless music. Any, uh, you're a songwriter yourself. Can you kind of like, uh, you know, don't give away all the, you know what I mean, the secrets and all that, but like any jewels he gave you as far as songwriting to help you? Yes, I think, um, well, as far as like giving away jewels, I'm happy to share any knowledge that I have with anybody because I feel like we're all artists and I think talent loves talent. So when you're surrounded by great talent, you, you know, you're, you're happy to share your knowledge. And I, I've learned from so many amazing people, but I asked my dad one time, what advice would you have for a young songwriter? And he said, there is no advice. My dad wasn't, a, he didn't like to preach. So, so often, especially like on social media, you'll see these little, you know, things people are saying, oh, well, live your life this way or do this or do that. My dad never wanted to tell people what to think. And he would write a lyric and he would call me and say, do I sound like I'm preaching? Because I shouldn't tell you, Mike, what to think about what you're hearing. You should be able to tune into it and decide for yourself. I mean, that is what is great about a wonderful song is that your audience gets to think for themselves and relate it to their own lives. They don't necessarily have to, you know, be exactly what the writer said. They could start envisioning in themselves what they, they feel it's about. And I think um, he said, I would take what I'd write and I would listen to it and I throw out everything I didn't like and I would you know critique myself and then I throw it out again and write rewrite it and rewrite it and write until it got to the place where I was happy with it and I think also one of the things problems that I have with today's writing is all the fake rhymes 
there are no more real rhymes anymore. Everybody will rhyme if it kind of sounds like that word, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, let's just put it in there. And my dad said one time, you know, Charlene, who was a singer, he had a big hit with called I've Never Been to Me. She asked him, you know, what do you think of today's writers? And he said, well, I, I just think that sometimes young writers get lazy. They just want to get it in there. And then if you're putting a rhyme for the sake of a rhyme and it has no continuity, it's not related to the beginning, middle or end of your story. So why did you put it in there? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that I try really hard when I'm writing my songs to sit down and 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 have it make sense but I'm not going to put a rhyme in there just for the sake of oh that sounds good I really want the lyrics to be meaningful and I also think that you know my dad said that he could one of his gifts was that he could he he knew on a piece of music what words should go in that place so um instead of you know somebody writing the words and then uh, or he would write the words and then they put the music around it. He would always want to have the music first. So when he hears something like touch me in the morning, you know, he knew that though touch me in the morning fit in that. Da -da -da -dee -da -da. He knew that those words went in there. And so I think that, um, you know, I try to do the same thing. What, what is the hook? What am I trying to say? And he could search for the title for, a day, weeks, months. But he said once he had the title, he could write the song in two minutes. Hey, yo, one thing I respect from that era, y'all got to say the nastiest stuff in the most classy way. You touch me in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> right, they, exactly. Like, song writers back in the day, they had a clever way of saying the nastiest, raunchy stuff. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you knew, you knew the real Ron Miller. <laughs> <laughs> And he wrote Touch Me in the Morning. What's funny about that song is that Diana Ross had been with the Supremes and she had just come out with, I think she she had come out with Lady Sings the Blues, the film. And uh, Barry Gordy was looking for a number one hit record for her. And he went to my dad and said, you know, we've got this young writer um, coming up. Michael Master, Michael Master, as you know, wrote all of Whitney's early, Whitney Houston's early tunes and uh, including The Greatest Love of All. Anyway, they got together and they wrote Touch Me in the Morning and had this huge hit. It was one of Diana Ross's first big hits to, to hit the scene when she came out as a solo artist. You know, I feel like songwriters don't get they just do a little bit. I mean, I know in rap, like, all right. If you're an artist and you got, uh, uh, you know, a uh, ghostwriter is kind of frowned upon, but like in other, any other genre, you know, it's, you know, encouraged. Do you have a top five dead or alive songwriter? Like, I don't think there's a list of like the best songwriters and your pop might be there. You know what I'm saying? Like, who are some of the like the biggest songwriters, at, you know, the hidden hand that's behind the scene that put out the best records, you know, alongside your, excuse me, alongside your father? Well, I mean, you have Stevie Wonder, uh, who wrote so many amazing songs. Um, the, uh, you have uh, Smokey Robinson mm -hmm. wrote so many. I mean, Babyface is known as an artist, but how many records did he write for other artists that was so big? I mean, there's just there the the list goes on and on of people who um, you know contribute to the artist's success. Um, and I and I think. I'm part of this new world now that's trying to tell the the story of these great songwriters. You know, my dad's not the only one. There were a lot of, you know, unsung heroes at Motown that are still out there that, you know, no one's ever heard of, but they they contributed to those um those records and um you know, I I want to tell my dad's story because I feel that my dad was unique in that he, you know, his lyric writing really resonated. And I think it's important, you know, as we go forward that, you know, we're, we're using our art to make the world a better place. And he was trying to do that back then. I mean, this is during when Marvin Gaye had what's going on. You know, my dad wrote Heaven Help Us All. You know, he wrote that lyric in 1970. It was, you know, uh, heaven, heaven, heaven help the black man if he struggles one more day. Heaven help the white man if he turns his back away. Heaven help the man who kicks the man who has to crawl heaven help us all I mean that's more profound now than when he wrote it you know all those years ago and Stevie recorded it but Ray Charles recorded it several times 
Ray Charles, I remember Heaven Help Us All was one of the last songs that it, I think it was the last song that he recorded and duet with uh, Gladys Knight on his Genius Loves Company. You know, okay. I mean, it was just those songs were really meaningful. And I think they contributed to this idea that, you know, we as artists have a voice. We can yeah can go out there and sing about freedom and equality and fairness. And, um, you know, we need to use our voice for that. Yeah. Phenomenal. Career. What made them go to the point where it's like, all right, I'm going to start like giving you guys alley-oops, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, actually just writing hits for everybody. And we talk about not just, you know, your average art. We talk about legends. I mean, everybody want to be like a star. You know what I mean? I would say, or, you know, like you want credit for your work. Your father was willing to take a step back and write these hits for these legends. And is he cool with that? Like, you know, is it, was there a part of him who want to be in the full, uh, on, on the main stage, front and center at all? Well, what's so funny is that I don't think that my dad ever wanted to be center stage, but I can tell mm -hmm. you this, that my dad had this aura about him. He, first of all, he's a big guy. His hands right. were like mitts, you know? <laughs> um, and he had this like incredible charm that wherever we were, Mike, I could go into a restaurant with this guy. Every waitress, every patron, every chef, everybody was around the table. And my dad was singing his new songs. You know, he, he, he was the kind of guy that could not stop writing. If he was on this interview with you right now, I guarantee you, he would have already written a song about you. He would have asked you about your life and he would have just written a song, not because he's trying to impress you, but he couldn't help himself. That's just who he was. Yeah. So he was center stage in his mm -hmm. life without trying to be, but fame and all that kind of stuff. I don't think that any of that ever mattered to my dad. Dad. I think he right. just wanted to write good songs and create great work. That was what was important to him yeah. more than anything else. Talk about some of your songwriting chapters. Would you write for other artists? I had absolutely. Yeah, um, I haven't written for other artists yet, but I do. Have, well, there have been a couple of times where people have sung my songs live. We've done it in our shows, in our rap pack shows. Um, I did a Christmas album um, called My Favorite Time of Year, and it, it's been performed in theaters and stages. And I have to say that as an artist, I I love singing. But when you hear somebody else sing your song, that's like a feeling that like you can't. It, it's such an amazing um, feeling because they get to interpret it the way they want to do it. Mm -hmm. the way they And you get to hear it in different ways in which you wrote it. Like as an example... I'm I'm having my first, th this is not for music, but this is for the musical that I'm writing, A Place in the Sun for Broadway. And I'm having my first table read. And to be able to, I've some of the actors have sent in self tapes for me to look at so uh, I can bring them in on the table read. To hear other people either recite what you've written or sing what you've written is such a, a, um, a satisfying feeling. It's, it's hard to articulate in words. Wow. I mean, we're not going to gloss over Broadway. <laughs> uh. <You know? laughs> so, yeah, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, we spoke on it a little bit, but, you know, talk a little bit more about, you know, Broadway, the theater and everything like that. Kind of give more insight on what you're doing out there and your contribution to the whole, you know, theater realm. Well, my father's dream was always to have a Broadway show. A lot of mm -hmm. people don't know that because when they think of Motown, they think of R&B and Stevie Wonder and everything. But mm -hmm. uh, Mickey Stevenson and Barry Gordy brought my dad in as a musical theater writer. My dad was originally from Chicago and he had Oscar Hammerstein was his was his hero. But he, um, you know, he had this musical theater background and. Uh, Barry Gordy, which I think is such a testament to what Barry Gordy was doing, said, let's bring this this white musical theater guy into Motown to to maybe, you know, bring our differences together, our cultural backgrounds, and let's see what we come up with. And what did they come up with? They came up with amazing songs, the Motown sound that has transcended time, that is a universal appeal to everybody. My dad always used to say, he said, I grew up in um, in Chicago as a, as a Jewish kid, and the Catholics hated me. 
me because I was a Jew. The Jews hated me because I was a terrible Jew. So I went out with Motown <laughs> and my brothers at Motown and they created this incredible sound. But he had all of this kind of musical theater. And he, you know, when you talk to some of the old Motown guys, they say, oh, your dad wanted to put strings on everything. And then my dad said, well, you guys want to put drums on everything. But when you put those things together, it was amazing. And my dad always wanted to have a Broadway show. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And I, I can tell you, Part of the reason is because he lost the intellectual property rights. When you lose the rights to your songs, you no longer have creative control of your vision. And if you want to make sure that your vision is going to get to the stage the way you dreamt it up, mm -hmm. you've got to hold on to the rights. And so unfortunately, my dad wasn't able to do that. But now my dream is to make sure that my dad hits that Broadway stage. So I am going to make that dream come true for him in my lifetime. I'm going to have a Broadway show. Uh, it's going to be a lot of hard work. But what we've been doing over the last several years is my husband and I produced this show called Sandy Hack's Rap Hack Show that I told you about. And we've been cultivating relationships throughout the theatrical community. I mean, we've performed in thousands of venues across the U.S. with this show, which is a really fun show. And I've I've gotten to learn a lot about putting a live theatrical production on stage. So now I'm in terms of producing it and, and writing it. So, but here, this is a little bit different because it's personal, it's my own life. And so to bring that together and it's going to be a much bigger production, it's going to take a while. It'll probably take a few years to put this show on its feet. However, that's why in the interim, I'm doing this, I want to call, I don't want to call it a smaller show. I'm doing the concert version of this, which is the For Once in My Life show, where I can at least sing the music. Man. Do you have any upcoming shows, like performing your music? You know, I know you what you're doing for your dad's legacy, but, you know, yes, we got to well, worry about Lisa's legacy, too. You yeah. know, you got any shows coming up, anything at all? Well, in all of the shows that I do, I always include my own music. So even in Rap Pack, we're doing my songs. And in Rap Pack, we we do some of my dad's songs, too. And then in this new show, uh, For Once in My Life, I, I have some of my own music. But I'm glad that you brought that up because this has come up several times. And yes, I am planning uh, to put a tour together for myself, but it'll probably be towards the end of the year. And I'd love to do a whole show of just of just the songs that I've written. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to pull up the No Wank or New London, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I want to come there. <laughs> For real. <laughs> so, you know, um, outside of entertainment, do you have any endeavors at all? Like, you know, we, we spoke about, you know, your business acumen, you know, I mean, Morgan Stanley and everything like that. And you're doing everything for your father's legacy and yourself. Anything outside of the entertainment realm that you rock with? You mean just in business or in or just in, in general, just anything? I don't know. I don't know. You do uh, painting or something. You know what I'm saying like anything. You know what I'm saying? Does anything outside of entertainment? Do you have any endeavors at all? You know, well, be clothing I, or pollen or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, um, you know, I I think of all the things that I've done, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. I've always said that uh, for everything I've done, you know, if I've never did anything else. I had two children that are the most amazing creatures on the planet. Do you have kids? No. You don't. Okay. Well, if you In ever yeah. <laughs> uh, if you ever become a parent one day, yeah. um, you know, it it I I think that um there's nothing else that is more important to me than my children and family and helping them. But interestingly, they're both incredibly talented. My daughter's beautiful. Um, she's an actress and a choreographer, a singer. My son is a singer and a writer. So for me, my when I do have extra time, it's always focused on them and what they're doing and what can I do to help them um, in whatever it is that they're pursuing. That's That's the most important to me. And other than that, like in terms of my personal life and what I love to do, I love traveling. I, I'm on a plane every week. Um, I, I love New York City. Um, I love the excitement of New York City. We have a lot of business there, but then it gets to be overload. So I love to come back to LA, which is where I'm based, and uh, drive my car down to Malibu Beach and with the top down and, and uh, you know, just hang out, put my water, my feet in the water. So <laughs> I'm getting a visual for next weekend. That won't be it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a good out there for real. It's crazy. My dad from Compton too. And I'm like, I'm kind of glad I wasn't raised in Compton, but I rather be out here. <laughs> but yeah, and I love Cali. But yeah, yeah. Um, anything else you want to say about your uh, your record? We about to uh, premiere your record. I need your love. Um, and uh, just anything else you know for the uh, listeners out here to kind of 
keep in touch and keep in tune with what you got going on. Um, well, I'm very excited about this. I need your love. I um, have another record out uh, that I released around the same time called Rhythm of Me, uh, mm -hmm. which is another kind of R&B, old school R&B. And I'm uh, really looking forward to pursuing my, you know, my own music career. I'm still going to work on all the stuff with my dad, but I, mm -hmm. I really am excited about this and I appreciate your support. And I think you're an amazing interviewer. I have to tell you, I've been interviewed by a lot of people. You are asking really incredible questions and I can tell that it's because you care and because you're really interested and, and that really comes across to me. Uh, and that's am why I'm blushing. I'm... I don't know. I, I try to just look at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Means life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much for having that's me. Great. So no, that we, like, you know, I kind of like to uh, conduct interviews like we having a conversation, you know. You know, I ain't like, you know what I mean, try to be, you know, messy and getting in your business and, you know, talk about all the negative stuff. Like, who wants to deal with that? You know, you superstar and I, you did all these great things. I, you might have one smudge in your record and now I got to spend the whole interview defending that. I don't do that here, you know what I'm saying? I just like to talk about the good stuff and, you know. Yeah. Well, I can tell that you know what's happening today and yet you have an appreciation for what came before that. And I think you take a genuine interest and that's why, you know, you do what you do and you do it well. And I thank you for having me on here. Now it's been a pleasure. Um, Lisa Dawn Miller, you know, um, <laughs> hopefully you can catch her at no wait whenever she pulled back. So we don't get to the record. Uh, Lisa stand back. I got to get you to do a drop. You know what I'm saying? You got to shout out the station and all that. But um, we're about to get to the record right now. I'll let you introduce it like we on like 106 and Park or something while I queue it up. Okay. What? Wait, wait. What? Uh, WD. It's WD. What up? WDUP. Yeah. What up? What up? What up? What up? With Mike. What is your <laughs> last name? Would you just go by Mike? Mike Mitch Eel. Now my last name Mitch. Oh, uh, we still live on air, so we're not doing the drop right now. I want to. I want you to introduce your record. You know what I'm saying? And then okay, I even the drop afterwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, industry record. All right, you know, I'll do it. I got you. So, yo, we got Lisa Dawn Miller. We're about to uh, debut the record. I Need Your Love. Her new single, Visual, might be dropping soon, featuring uh, Marcus H. And yes. um, we're going to get to it. All right. We off here. Uh, okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 